So, um, so you guys saw the application of a Kirchhoff's rules in very simple cases. And we even derived these formulas. And the truth is, there are a lot of problems you can solve with this. And I hope it's intuitive for everyone how you would extend this in case you're adding more than two registers. Like if you're adding three registers in series, what do you think the modified version of this formula will be? Just one more, right? What about modify the version of this one if you're adding three registers in parallel? Adding one over okay. three. And it's just here, right? In reciprocal again. Yeah. So, so these are pretty useful formulas that you might use. And there are some homework questions that you can do using only this. What I want to point out is that um, there will be some questions where you cannot solve it using these alone. In fact, the circuit that you see here is one such example. So um, let me draw a version of this, or you know, one that looks similar to this um, on that board over there. And I will try to explain why it's impossible for you to answer this question only by trying to add registers in series and parallel and simplifying circuit that way. So um, this is what that circuit looks like. I have a register up here. And I'm going to actually give them generic labels, R1. So in this circuit, to solve this circuit would mean to find this current. So there's a current that's flowing through this battery. Um, for my own reasons, I'm going to call that current I3. And there's going to be a current that's flowing through this battery. For my own reasons, again, I'm going to call that I2. And there's a b going to be a current maybe flowing this way here. Let me call that I1. So to solve this circuit would mean to find what each of these currents are in terms of the voltages and the resistances that are given to you. Good. So, I keep telling you that you cannot do this using these formulas alone. Why not? I mean, couldn't I add these registers R1 and R2, simplify this upper half, and then you know, simplify that with this R3 again, and do it that way? Yeah, because of this battery here. In fact, that's the whole reason I inserted the battery there. If you didn't have this battery, you could have simplified this circuit using these rules. You know, add these two as parallel, then the remaining is a series, add them as series, and you're done. But because of this battery, all of that is ruined. These are not in series because of this junction, and they are also not in parallel because of this battery. So this is, um, so this is a good example of a general circuit that you might have to solve, where your circuit elements are not in series or parallel with any other element. So if all your problem solving tool was this, something you might have learned in high school physics, then you're kind of stuck here. There's no tool that you can use here that's based on these two. But if you know the very basic circuit solving tools, we can go back to here. Come up with a system of equations, and then solve the system of equations to find I1, I2, and I3. Good? So let's do that. Um, now that I've convinced you that the methods you might have used in high school physics doesn't work, let's uh, you know, use the one that actually works that we cover in college physics. Um, actually, technically, this is university physics, but I can imagine this being covered in college physics since it's algebra. <laughs> so, all right, so we are going to use Kirchhoff's rules. Um, which of the uh, two rules do I usually use first, junction rule or loop rule? Junction rule, um, for the reasons I was explaining earlier. So how many times can I use my junction rule here? I see two junctions. Can I use it twice? How many times? Yeah, I'm going to be able to use it only once. So let me pick just the one to use. I'll use this one to use. So this is, I'm going to use this junction to write down my junction rule. OK, before I do that, um, how many unknowns do you think I'll have that I need to solve for? 
three, I mean, that's labeled here, the currents that I labeled, right? That's, by the way, one of the reasons to actually label the currents in each of the branches. That'll tell you the number of unknowns before you write down any equation. So I'm going to need three equations total. So, all right, I got one taken care of. I need two more. Where am I going to get those two? Yeah, I'm going to use loop rule two, twice to come up with my um, to come up with my total of three equations, and uh, I guess I can pick the same loop I did last time. Mm. Do I want to do that? Yeah, yeah. Let me do that. I, I think there's actually some interesting possibilities here. So the loops I'm going to pick are well, loop involving this. So starting from this point here, I'll go around, 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 and come back here. This is going to be my loop number one. And my loop number two, um, let me start from this point here, just behind the battery, and then go around, and come back to this point, my loop number two. And you, oh, sorry, <laughs> let me label them by the equation number that I'm going to be using, two and three. Um, and you know, you might want to verify that they avoid overlap as much as possible. That they do overlap in one branch, but, um, but that's it. They, they each have parts that's not overlapping with the other loops. Yeah. So these are, this is my plan for com coming up with one, two, three equations, which will hopefully allow me to solve for one, two, three unknowns. Good. Okay, so now that I have the plan, let me write down those equations and see if they satisfy my criteria. So equation one is based on the junction. Uh, what are my currents coming in? By the way, before I do that, let me ask you this question. Um, so current I1, I'm pretty sure that has to be the direction. Because based on the batteries, like I'm pretty sure voltage here is higher than voltage here, right? So I1 has to flow that way. With the currents I2 and I3, is it like guaranteed to be like this direction? There's a possibility that it might be different, right? You can imagine V2 being very, very small. In that case, I2 would actually flow this way. So I guess this is the question I want to touch on and make sure you guys understand. So do, should I worry about that? Should I uh, sort of try to figure out what the actual direction of current is before deciding on one? Or can I kind of label one direction and stick with it? Maybe you can label it and use the signs later to... Yeah. yeah. So with the direction of current, that's actually going to be true in every single case. I could have labeled I1 going the other way. And um, as long as I follow a consistent set of rules, um, if the result I get will be correct. And when my final answer gives me negative current, that will be my indication that I should flip the actual direction of the current. So here, even though I don't really know actual direction of I2 and I3, I labeled it some way. And I'm going to just assume that this is the correct direction and uh, do the rest of the problem that way. So for junction one, what's my current coming in? Just the I1, right? Follow it, it comes into the junction. So I1, that's equal to my two currents going up, I2 and I3. So I1 is equal to I2 plus I3. All right, that seems like a good start. Um, equation two comes from my first two loop. So as I go across my battery, I'm going to gain voltage of plus V1. As I go across this register, um, does my voltage rise or uh, drop? Drop, I'm going with the current, so it drops. So it's minus I3 R3. That's kind of why I labeled it I3, <laughs> so that the numbers go with the register. Uh, it's easier to avoid the confusion that way. Um, sometimes it's equations for circuit analysis, they can get really complicated. Some of your homework questions are that way. 
All right, I still have half, another half of the loop. OK, uh, then from here, I'm going to go across this register. Am I gaining or losing voltage? OK, it looks like I'm losing voltage. But um, so that's based on the direction of the current that I labeled, right? What if it's the other way? Is that something for me to worry about? The answer is no. Let me write it down, and I'll tell you why. So here. Um, I would say, all right, if the current is actually going this way, I would say I gain the voltage of plus I2 R2, right? Now, suppose I was wrong about the direction of the current, that it actually would have been voltage drop going from here to here. Then what that would mean is my answer to I2 would be negative. So this expression still would represent a voltage drop. So when you're trying to figure out what is the uh, rise and drop of voltage, uh, you worry about what direction of current did you label, not what is the actual direction of current. It's the direction of current that you labeled that overrules everything else. Because you're trying to be consistent with the direction that you picked. OK, uh, my last element before I come back to complete my loop. So as I go across this battery, am I gaining or losing voltage? Right, losing. I'm going from positive terminal to negative terminal. Now, what if my direction of current were to flip? Then should I say I'm actually gaining voltage? Yeah, still losing. So with the batteries, um, direction of current doesn't matter. It's the direction of your path that matters. So that's actually the sign convention. So the sign convention for registers say that you lose the voltage when you're going with the current. You gain voltage when you are going against current. And the second sign convention is the one for volt battery. It says you lose voltage when you are going from positive to negative terminal. You gain voltage when you go from negative to positive terminal without regard to current direction. So those are the sign rules. It's a fairly intuitive once you understand it. So this should be minus V1, I'm sorry, V2. That completes my loop. So this is equal to 0. Uh, all right, let me finish loop three. Um, I'll go through this more quickly. So it'll be across the battery, plus V2 from negative to positive, across the register with the current, so minus I2 R2, across the register with the current again, minus I1 R1, come back to the same point, is equal to zero. All right, these are my three equations, um, three unknowns, I should be able to solve it, right? Yeah. So, um, so you know, almost all the circuit problems you deal with will be like equation of a system of three equations or more. Um, that's why I say you know the algebra is going to be more complicated than what you remember from physics 4A. So um, you should take time to come up with a plan. Like when you see something like this, um, I have three equations, three unknowns. Um, it looks fairly complicated enough that I should act have an actual plan before I do anything. Um, any suggestions on what I should do first? So with algebra, it'll come from experience. By the way, um, one of the ways you should be using Mathematica, Mathematica can solve this system of equations in one command. I think that's one of the demonstrations you had in the Mathematica addendum. So you can use that to check your answer. Um, now, if you're doing algebra by hand, which you'll have to do on the exam. <laughs> um, so my recommendation would be, um, I look for uh, one, two things. One thing that I look for is, is there any equation that's in terms of only one unknown? That's the one that I would want to handle the first. And that's actually what we did here. There was an equation in terms of only one unknown. I solved for it. And that was a useful tool for me to have. Um, now, here, there's nothing like that. Then what I look for, the second thing, is there, is there an unknown that occurs a lot? Like I2 occurs in every single one of the equations. So what I'm going to do is, all right, I want to get rid of I2 as soon as possible. So I'm going to solve one of those three equations in terms of I2 to get rid of it. Then I'll reduce my system down to a system of two equations in terms of only two unknowns. Okay. So um, 
So let me do that. I think what I am going to do is I am going to solve the first equation in terms of I2. So solve this for I2. So I2 is equal to I1 minus I3. And I am going to plug this into both of these to get new set system of equations that has only two unknowns. So uh, plug it in here. Oops. Here. So this is my new equation too. It will be V1 minus I3 is fine, R3. Uh, and I'm going to plug it in. Let me, do I want to distribute it? Yeah, let me distribute it as I do it. I'm going to plug it in here. So I get plus I1 R2 minus I3 R2 minus I3 R2 minus V2 is equal to 0. Let me do some simplification in place. I have two like terms with the same I3, right? So I am going to combine these two. Um, so that would be minus I3, R3 plus R2. Everyone agree? Yes? So let me do that. Uh, I, let me move this around. So it'll be this plus R, R2. <laughs> And then minus I1, no, sorry, minus, yeah, yeah, I1, R2. Good? I changed this around okay? Good. All right. Um, all right, so this is one of my equations, the new system of equation. I need to do the same thing for equation three. So my new equation three is going to be V2, Minus, all right, I have this I2. I'm going to plug this in and do the substitution on the fly. And in fact, let me plan this out ahead of time. When I plug in I1, that's going to give me a like term with this, right? So I'll have minus I1 R2 minus I1 R1. So I'm going to write it down from the beginning as minus I1 R2 plus R1. Good. So I handle this, let me handle I3 there. So it's minus, minus I3, so it'll be plus I3 R2 is equal to zero. Good? All right, I have two equations, two unknowns, I1 and I3. So I solve for it. Um, it I guess it, from here the choices are like, they are equivalent. You can do kind of one or the other, and they would be equally complex. So let me just do one. Um, I'll do it here. I will solve this for I3 to plug it in here. Question? Sorry, are you looking at this? This one? Oh, it was plus I2, uh -huh. but this I1 that's coming from, yes, I think you're right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's why, yeah, thank you. Uh, it should be plus. <laughs> All right, <laughs> good. Good that we caught that mistake now. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to solve, solve this for I3. So that means, I guess I can imagine moving this to the other side and divide up by R2 plus R3. So when I do that, this is what I'm going to get. I'm going to get um, I3 is equal to everything on the left-hand side added, V1 minus V2 plus I1 R2. So V1 minus V2 plus I1 R2 divided by this thing that I took over to the other side. So R2 plus R3. plug this in here, then you end up with this equation. I think I'm just going to alternate between purple and black. So this equation will turn into V2 minus I1 R2 plus R1 plus this I3. <sighs> Complicated. Um, so V1 minus V2 plus I I1 R2 divided by 
R2 plus R3 times R2 is equal to 0. All right, it's just going to look complicated. Um, so let me collect all the like terms. So I think I can collect the like terms in terms of I1 on the other side. When I do that, this is what I get. V2 plus all of this that's left here um, plus V1, or let me write it this way. V1 minus V2 multiplied with R2 over this. R2 over R2 plus R3. So those terms I have taken care of. One, two, three. Um, all right. And the other terms, I'm going to move to the other side. So it'll be plus I1, R1 plus R2. And then this will become minus I1, R2 squared over R2 plus R3. Good? I can actually simplify this a little bit, I think. Yes. Um, if I uh, combine the denominators, make them share the same denominator, R2 plus R3, then I have to multiply this by R2 plus R3. Believe it or not, that will actually simplify things a little bit. Let me write it out so that you can see what simplifies. So when I write it out, uh, if I write down along this line, can everyone read it? Yeah, OK. So let me write it there. All right, this is going to be I1. Um, yeah. um, so divided by R2 plus R3. So I'm factoring out I1 and R2 plus R3 to the front. And this is the rest of the remaining terms. R1 times R2. R1 times R2. R1 times R3. R1 times R3. R2 times R2. So R2 squared plus R2 times R3. R2 times R3 minus R2 squared. So what I'm saying simplifies is these two things cancel. Yep. Yes. So that we can say all of this left-hand side is equal to I1 over R1 plus R3 times all of that. It's actually, um, in some sense, it's simple. The one, two, three. These three terms are all three possible pairs of R1, 2, and 3. So it's easier to remember that way. R1, R2 plus R1, R3 plus R2, R3. And to actually solve for I1, um, I would have to you know, divide both sides by this, and then that will be I1. And I guess I'm kind of out of space, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, so with the circuit problems, what you will see is that you guys already know how much I hate plugging in numbers, right? But um, at some point with the circuit problems like this, I do have to give you numbers. Because algebra gets uh, horrendous at some point just with all the, these different parameters. But um, so with this, you can see that I can solve for I1 in terms of everything that's known. Right? Yes? Like in this equation, the only unknown is I1. If I have numerical values for everything else, I can solve for I1, which means I can plug that I1 into here to get I3. And I can plug that I1 and I3 into here to get I2. So that's how you solve for all the currents in this circuit. So, um, so this is an example of a problem that can only be done using the general problem solving technique using Kirchhoff's rules. 